be chosen. Okay. Racklin looks at how patterns of behavior act as a reinforcement for self-control. Like Skinner, Racklin also uses pigeons to test his ideas. In the first condition, a pigeon chooses between a small, immediate reward and a larger but delayed reward. If it pecks the green button, it gets a small amount of food right away. If it pecks the red button, it has to wait a few seconds, but it gets twice as much food by pressing the red button. Pigeons are very impulsive. Almost 100% of the time, pigeons will go for the smaller, immediate reward. In another condition, we'll say to the pigeon, instead of pecking the key just once to get that reward, you have to peck the key 15 times. And when we ask the pigeon to, make, to peck the key 15 times to get either reward, it will start pecking on the key leading to the larger reward. So when it only has to peck once, it's right up against the small reward, and it takes the small reward. Whereas when you, if you put the pigeon back, and it has to peck 15 times, it sees the rewards as they are. And seeing the rewards as they are, it starts pecking the key that leads to the larger reward. Racklin demonstrates that following the 15th peck on the green button, the pigeon receives a small but immediate reward of food. The case is different with the red button. After the 15th peck on the red button, the pigeon has to wait an additional four seconds, but the reward is larger. The pigeon chooses the red button, leading to the larger delayed reward, illustrating that a pattern of behavior can reinforce the choices that lead to self-control. The rewards of self-control are very hard to pin down, very hard to isolate, and they're not simply the sum of a bunch of instants. Just like listening to a song is not simply the sum of a bunch of notes, it's a, some abstract relationship. A song is a certain relationship, and that relationship takes time to occur. And these rewards are like songs in that sense. They take time to occur, and they're not simply the sum of a bunch of instants. Racklin believes that recognizing alternatives to a particular behavior helps to change that behavior. For instance, if we want to stop smoking, it is not enough to take away the cigarettes. You need to reinforce the potentially larger but delayed benefits of not smoking, such as experiencing better health, having more money, and increased social approval. The difference between my view and Skinner is that we not only look at the consequences of the specific act that we might want to change, but also the alternatives. We focus on both of those because sometimes the best way to manipulate a certain behavior is not to work on the behavior itself, but to work on the alternatives. Operant conditioning has been applied in several settings beyond the research laboratories where it was first discovered. These are not mechanical devices. These are dogs. That means that they don't always do everything perfectly every time. This promotional film shows a San Diego training program called Canines for Independence. Using behavioral principles, these dogs have learned to assist in the care of disabled patients. Desired behaviors are reinforced by means of operant conditioning until the dog learns a new routine in which a complex sequence of responses are chained together. So I got him to jump up on the table and it took me about to three or four times telling him what I wanted. And then he got it and handed it to me. And now he just does it all the time. I do this. It's just one command for him to get, to get it. Now I don't have The to dogs to learn to retrieve objects. They learn to pull wheelchairs and even push elevated buttons. I didn't know it was going to be like this when I first started, but after I went through it, it's all come true. After uh, learning all these commands, everything's, everything that I've learned, you know, it's, it's working, it's all working. We've seen some of the ways in which individuals learn how to change their situation. 
But what happens if they learn that nothing makes a difference? What happens if they learn to give up entirely? Can we use conditioning to overcome such learned helplessness? Fortunately, the answer for many distressed people is yes. This woman is undergoing behavior therapy for agoraphobia. Agoraphobia, the fear of public places, imprisons untold numbers of people, mostly women, in their homes. That's good. Let's take that deep breath. That's good. We're going to have one more step. The unique feature of this behavior therapy is its pragmatic focus on directly changing the problem behavior, the individual's symptoms. There's no attempt to find out what caused the behavior, only identifying and changing the sources of reinforcement that keep it going in the wrong direction. The problem is treated by learning to cope with a fearful emotion and by arranging new positive consequences for the desired behavior. So learning can be positive and it can be negative. But whatever we learn, whether it's the reinforcing consequences of our behavior or the futility of our actions, something more than behavior is changed. There's also a change in our knowledge. And for that knowledge to direct our future actions, it must be remembered, which means somehow it must be registered in our memory and called into play upon demand.